Anybody gonna have any problem hearing me today? I, I got a pretty loud voice. I'll get kind of crazy here, so I don't think I, I got a mic, but I'd rather have my hands free because I got some props here. So, in any event, thanks for coming today. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm not masked up today so that you guys can hear me. I want to make sure you hear me. No symptoms. I feel great. No temperature. No fever. I'm feeling great today, so so I'm good. But I want to make sure that you guys were able to hear me today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Keith Wilhide. I'm the service manager here at Beckley's. Um, been here 20 years. Um, been a service manager since 2006. Uh, my previous life, I worked at a manufacturer, um, Fleetwood, that's now renamed Rev, Rev Group, but Fleetwood back in their day. I worked for them for 15 years and then came over to the retail side. So kind of been on both sides of the fence. Um, this is going to be real casual today. I, I don't want uh, uh, you guys to hesitate asking any questions. If you have anything that uh, you want to share with the group, certainly feel free to do so. Um, very informal. I'm here for you, so anything that you guys have, bear with me. I might have a funny story or two, corny maybe, but um, I, I, my primary objective today is to teach you guys how to winterize your unit. Um, it's very simple. Um, all you do is just get the, wherever there's water in your unit, you remove the water from the coach and you put antifreeze in its place. Pretty simple, right? Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys for coming today. Uh, oh, okay, no. Uh, okay, so um, um, again, uh, it is, it's very simple. Um, I actually already did my unit. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm done camping for the year. I have an old class, class A motorhome, and it, I've been doing it for several years, the same unit for several years. Of course, I got a little background in it, uh, but it took me about 25 minutes. So it's not a very complicated thing. They are a little more complicated today than, than my antique uh, because of exterior showers and second bathrooms and stuff like that. I mean, they're pretty fancy today. And, uh, but the key again is to recognize where there was water, remove the water from the coach, and replace it with antifreeze. And if you keep that in mind and just think about it, if you don't overlook anything, you should have no problems in the spring when you're ready to go camping again, okay? So the handout that I gave you today, um, uh, the first page front and back is a, a, our winterization step. This is actually, this, this handout was made as a result of the way we winterize units. And we've been doing this as long as I've been here and it was here when I got here. This, this particular process was in place when I got here. Uh, you probably heard from the PA thing. We've been in business 40 years. I've been here 20. Uh, this is 20 plus, I can tell you for sure. Um, and it's just a step by step. Um, so if you follow this, um, you should be in good shape in the spring. So um, we'll go over it real quick. I got some props here that I'm gonna show you um, and kind of talk about it. And, uh, um, and we'll, we'll elaborate a little bit. And again, feel free to ask questions. This is very informal, just chime up, you know, however, however you feel comfortable. Um, I'll be hanging out after the seminar if you guys have any questions individually. So let me get them a handout real quick. Thanks for coming, guys. Here's a $10 coupon for the store, too. Okay, so um, the very first step, obviously, is to drain the fresh water tank. Uh, pretty much anything today has a fresh water tank in it, and you want to drain the fresh water tank. Um, if you bought this year and you don't have, you've never put water in your fresh water tank, we did, because we checked the system prior to you purchasing it. So regardless of whether you've done it or not, if it's a new unit, it's got water in it, and you've got to drain that tank. There's several different ways that tanks are drained depending upon what it is. Let's, let's ask, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I'd like to know what audience I have. So how about like pop-ups and like little guys, little, the little teardrop things, we got one there. Okay, two, three. How about like trailers and fifth wheels? About half of you. And then motorhomes, class C, class A. Okay, great, so we got a nice mix. Okay, so um, there are some variables between those groups of, of, of product, of course. Um, uh, the sophistication of them, the amount of stuff that you have to look for, that's going to vary a little bit. 
All of them have fresh water tanks. Um, there's going to be a plug on the bottom. Unfortunately, you've got to get down on the ground in some cases. You can look underneath your unit. There's going to be a cap. It might look like this cap. There might just be a cap on a drain line that comes down through the floor. It might look like that. There might be a petcock where you actually twist a petcock and it just opens and closes. Um, there, the, 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 the units that are um, a little bit more fancy, they might have a valve on the inside. Um, if the, what kind of motorhome do you guys, you folks have? Adventure. Adventure. Winnebago probably has a valve on the inside near the tank. And you just open up the valve and it's inside. So you kind of have to find the location of the water tank inside. There's a valve close by. Open up the valve. It'll drain out onto the ground. So, so I don't have all of the exact specifications for all of the units, but there's a water tank and there's a, there's a way to drain it. So we got to drain the tank. Number two is open the low point water line drains. Again, uh, most all of the plumbing systems have low point water line drains. Um, the same thing holds true. Um, there's two lines that are probably sticking down through the floor. Today's world have red plumbing lines and blue plumbing lines, indicating the temperature of the water. Um, so you might see a blue line and a red line together sticking out through the floor. Those are your low point water line drains. And again, they might have a cap on them, they might have a plug on them, there might be a valve inside. Somehow, if you see those lines, they're low point lines and they can be opened up. And when you open them up, obviously the plumbing lines are going to drain. If you don't have one, if it's an older unit, which you may, if, it's, if it is an older unit, um, and again, I mentioned my experiences, 35 years now, I promise you in 1985 when I started in this crazy business, there was not low point water line drains. So if you happen to have a 1985 wilderness travel trailer, <laughs> it doesn't have low point water line drains. But it may have an exterior shower. And so it, in the event that you do not have, um, a, a, an exterior shower can serve as a low point water line drain. Okay. Um, number three is turn off the electric water heater switch. We want to do that because it's just, if it's electric water heater, it's just like the electric water heater in your house and it's got an element, an electric element. And a dry fired electric element will last a whole 10 seconds and then you'll burn up the element. So the element has to be turned off before we drain the water heater tank. So let's do that before we get any further, okay? Um, if you're unsure whether you have an electric side of your water heater, it's real simple to find out. Um, electric, just like electric in your house, have breakers. And an RV will have a dedicated 110 breaker in your breaker box for your water heater. It will be labeled water heater. It might be WTR, HTR, or it might be WH. But if you see a, an independent breaker in your breaker box that's identified for a water heater, it's an electric water heater, and that's an easy way to turn it off. Just turn off the breaker. And now you don't have to worry about any switches because that disconnects all your power to your water heater. Um, if you don't have an electric water heater side, my antique is only a gas water heater, uh, there's nothing to do. I don't have... I don't have an electric water heater. I don't have anything to turn off, okay? And we might see some of those things on this list today that won't apply. And that's a one that doesn't apply to me. Uh, number four, drain the water heater. Okay, well, of course, we want to turn the electric off before we drain the water heater. That's why number three is in front of number four. Okay, so... Um, so there's two different water heaters out there, primarily. There's a couple other unique stuff. There's some, uh, there's some InstaHot and stuff like that. And I would encourage you, InstaHot's kind of a tricky little animal, so I would encourage you to make sure you're winterizing your InstaHots properly. That's not just kind of standard run-of-the-mill winterization. So I'd, I'm going to defer that to your owner's manual and make sure you know what you're doing with your InstaHot, okay? Um, but standard water heaters, there's primarily, there's two games in town. Um, they've been around forever, uh, Atwood water heater and a suburban water heater. 
and there's a distinct difference between the two. Atwood uses an aluminum tank. So um, it just has a plastic plug in it. And it's on the face of the water heater from the outside, the door that folds down on the outside. You fold that down, you'll see this plastic plug. And it's a pretty unique size too. It's 15 sixteenths of an inch. So you're not just gonna get your standard $20 socket set out and have a 15 sixteenths in there. It's a special socket. So you're gonna have to get one if you don't have one. It's real difficult to get in there with vice grips or an adjustable wrench or something like that. There's just no room to work in there. You almost, it's almost imperative to get a deep well socket that'll reach in there so that you can get to that plug and, and take it out. And again, it's kind of a special size. It's 15 sixteenths. It's plastic because it's an aluminum tank. So in the event that you cross thread the plug, you want to tear up the plug, not the tank. So I would discourage you from putting anything other than plastic back in for that reason. And guess what I did this year when I put my plug back in? I did it. I have an Atwood water heater and I cross threaded the plug. It's very easy to do, it's plastic. So, um, so that's an Atwood side. Uh, the Suburban has a steel glass lined tank. Um, and most everybody knows what happens when you introduce water to steel. It rusts, it deteriorates, okay, over time. So it has a glass lining inside the Suburban tank. That's to protect the lining of the tank because there's water in it. Um, that comes in, uh, that brings in an anode rod. So this is not, you're not gonna find this on a Suburban tank. You're gonna find an anode rod. It looks like that, okay? This anode rod is made primarily of magnesium. There's three or four other components, but magnesium attracts the contaminants in water and it'll start pitting this rod. So the intent for this anode rod is so that the contaminants in the water attack the rod, not the tank. This will start to pit and get eat up and you'll see that it's starting to deteriorate. Um, I wish I had one, I don't, but um, when you pull this out for the first time, you'll see little pits and it'll, be, it'll start to be deteriorating and stuff and you'll go, oh no, it's supposed to look like that. And I'll say, oh no, it's supposed to look like that. Not, not like this, like that. It's doing its job. And the initial anode rod needs to dissipate completely because that coats the inside of that tank, okay? It does two things. It attracts the contaminants and it also coats the tank. So just because it has a couple pits in it, it's perfectly fine, it's doing its job, all right? The first one, the owner's manual in suburban water heater says completely. Now, completely every tiny little speck, probably not. But the vast majority of it, if you looked at the end of this, there's a, there's a piece of steel that this, this material is actually attached to. It's about the size of lead in a pencil, okay? That's what's left. That's what'll be left. If it completely deteriorates, that's all that'll be left is a little tiny, thin, steel dowel rod, that's all that's left. Um, you'll see it, when it starts to deteriorate, it'll kind of like, there'll be pieces of it that'll deteriorate, and you'll start to see it. When it's mostly gone, it's time to replace it. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, talking about interesting sizes, uh, this socket size is one and one sixteenth. So again, that's not going to be in a typical set. You're going to have to buy one. Um, this is a little easier to get to. It's right dead square in the middle at the bottom of a suburban tank. And an Atwood tank is off in the corner. And speaking of Atwood tanks, here is one. A bad one. So this is where the plug is on the Atwood tank. This is, what, this is an aluminum tank, as you can see. And this is where the plug would be. This is the combustion chamber where the gas would fire. This is what heats it. This goes through and comes out up here. This is where the exhaust is. 
This is actually an electric, this actually has an electric element too. It would be right here. That's where the electric element would be. So this particular inner tank was for a gas and electric combination. And of course, this is what to avoid, okay? Um, this is a water heater that wasn't winterized. This is a real, obviously, this is a real scenario that we ran into several years ago. This has been a prop of mine for six or eight or 10 years now doing these seminars. And this is what happens when a full tank of water freezes. It's no different than a bottle of water. If you had a full, full bottle of water and you put it in the freezer, it's gonna bust the plastic, right? It's gonna bust out of the plastic. It's no different. So. Does it have to be full to make it look like it? Or is it just a little bit of water? Yeah, if it's a little bit of water, it probably has some room to expand. And we will talk about that a little later in the winterization process that you, that you can't get all the water out of it anyway. Um, and then, of course, we'll talk about bypass here in a second. You have two, you have an inlet side and an output side. Your cold line's coming in the bottom and your hot side's coming out the top. So that's what this is on the back of the water heater. And of course, I said, as I said, it's an electric, this is an electric tank too, so it's got a little module on the back. But this is an Atwood tank. This is where the plug would be. This is where you'd have to drain it right here. And just, I guess we'll talk about it since you asked about it. You can see what would happen when you drain that. The drain is higher than the bottom of the tank. So even when you drain it, you're not getting all the water out of it. You can kind of see that, how it would be valleyed, and this is the drain. Unless we could turn it on its side, I don't know, no, 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 we can't do that. Okay, all right. So we just drained the water heater. Number five says hook up, um, city, so hook up air to your city water inlet and blow out the water heater in the low point drains with a maximum of 25 PSI, okay? So, um, and I just had a discussion a minute ago with this gentleman. Uh, we have a blowout plug available in the store. Uh, that coupon that you got probably will cover it. Um, actually it will, $7. Uh, this screws onto your city water inlet and there's an air chuck on it. You can see there's an air chuck on it. So you hook up your compressor and the water heater plug is still out and your low point water line drains are open because we haven't done anything with them yet. Remember the couple steps before. So now we have compressed air, limited to 25 PSI. Most small compressors are probably not gonna hurt your plumbing system, a little pancake uh, compressor this gentleman mentioned. Um, um, I have a little bit bigger uh, air compressor in my house, so I regulate that with air pressure. So you need an air pressure regulator, not your water pressure regulator. There's a difference. Um, and I don't know the science behind it, but a water pressure regulator will not regulate air pressure. I, again, I'm not, yeah. Is it correct that you can use the kind of little compressor to uh, pump up your tire? Sure, you can. You can. You can. The, the, the question was a little tiny little air, tire pressure thing, tire air, uh, com, uh, air compressor. The scenario there is, is that um, the, the, the 25 PSI pushing through, say, a 30-foot travel trailer is going to be more effective than the little briefcase compressor type thing. It, it's, still, it's, still doing, it, it's still doing what you're trying to accomplish. It might just take longer or um, um, it, it, it might not be quite as effective. This hooks up to your city water connection, that's correct. Um, and we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna replace where all the water is with antifreeze anyway, so we don't have to be so anal that every drop of water is out of the unit. The key here is to just get the vast majority of the water out for now. There's no reason to have it in there. Let's get it out, and then we're gonna replace everything, all, all areas of plumbing um, with antifreeze, okay? All right, so we just blew out the water heater in the low point water line, or water line drains, and then we're gonna close those up. So we put the plug back in the water heater, and we close the low point water line drains, but we leave the compressed air hooked up. And then we go to each individual area, each faucet. We go to the kitchen faucet, 
Go to the bathroom faucet, your outside shower, your second bathroom, your outside kitchen, um, your toilets, your shower, every, everywhere there's water or was water. You just want to go and take a quick walk through, open up your cold faucet. If you have a single lever faucet, cold first, that's your cold line, hot second, that's your hot line. Let the air compressor, if there's, if there's water laying there, because all we did is use, up until this point, all we did is use gravity to drain the lines, and then we blew out the tank, and we blew out the low point water line drains, but we didn't get up top, okay? So we might have some water trapped in the faucet, that kind of thing. So we're just kind of, that's just another precautionary measure. And again, this step is the step that we do because we guarantee our work. So we're gonna make sure that water's gone, antifreeze is replaced, and you open up in the spring and you don't have any problems. Because if you do and we did it, we warranty it. We, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it. If we, did, if we miss something, we're gonna fix it. It's not gonna cost you anything if you paid us to do it. So just kind of take a quick walk through. You're still hooked up to compressed air. Just open them up, let some air blow through those particular fixtures everywhere, including your toilet and just kind of get the water out, all right? Um, that was number six. Number seven talks about um, filtered water. And again, filtered water is kind of becoming more popular in today's products than it was years ago. Um, my recommendation, my personal recommendation, is that if you have a water filter, just filter through it, just, just winterize through it. Um, that way you don't have to worry about any filter bypass, you just, there's nothing to worry about. Just winterize through the filter. Now the filter sometimes, depending upon the, um, the quality of the filter, sometimes the filter will catch the dye in the antifreeze. Okay, what I mean by that is RV antifreeze is pink. Okay, it's non-toxic, it won't hurt you. I've, I've, mistakenly got it in my mouth before. It doesn't taste good, but doesn't hurt you, okay? But it's pink. The pink is just dye, okay? If it was clear, you wouldn't know it was there. So when you're running antifreeze, antifreeze through your unit, or maybe even when you're dewinterizing your unit in the spring, and it goes from pink to clear, you know that the antifreeze is out, okay? This is just dye. And some better quality filters, if you're winterizing through a filter, the filter will grab the dye. So it might not be pink, so just precautionary measure. Doesn't mean it's not winterized. And you can kind of feel it. It feels kind of slimy or soapy, okay? It's kind of got a little bit of a slimy texture to it. So if you are winterizing through a filter, just let it, let, make, just kind of feel it and see if, you, if it feels kind of different. It'll feel different in water, okay? You'll know the difference. Um, but the reason I say through filters is you're probably going to want to replace your filter every spring anyway. It's recommended by most of the most of the manufacturers that do filtered water in an RV setting that you replace the filter in the spring anyway. So there are bypass valves for filters, um, um, or you have to get a little tricky and maybe make something, um, um, and you can take the filter and put it in like a Ziploc bag and store it until the spring. We see that sometimes. Some customers do their own winterization and then they bring it for something in the spring and it hasn't been dewinterized yet. We'll see a filter laying in a sink in a Ziploc bag and that's perfectly okay. So if you're gonna do that, you need to bypass that filter cartridge, okay? Um, that's the, my long-winded story on number seven. Um, number eight, find the water pump and unhook the suction side of a water pump. Now again, um, my motorhome, even though it's older, it has a winterization kit at the water pump. Um, and they're available, I'll show you one here in a second. New stuff, like I did a, I did a, a little mini version of this um, about a month ago with the service staff across the street. And um, we did it on a Momentum fifth wheel. It was a, um, a used unit that we had in stock. It was, our, it was Beckley's unit. It was a trade, it was used. I knew it wasn't winterized, it's like a 2018. And they have this really nice service panel on the outside where all your, all your hookups are. And there's a series of different valves. 
And all you do is just turn the valves to a certain, there's little pictures and it says turn the valves this way for winterized. And you hook up a draw tube to the city water connection. And because of the way those valves are hooked up, it draws antifreeze right out of the tank. I mean, out of the gallon of uh, um, antifreeze. If you don't have that really fancy service panel, you have to locate your water pump. And there's going to be, if it has one, or if somebody else, if it's a used unit and somebody has installed one, or if the factory installed one, you're going to have a little kit that's going to look kind of like this. It's a clear tube. There's a little valve on it. And it's near the water pump. And you just turn that valve. The suction side of the water pump is going to draw antifreeze out of the antifreeze jug into the unit. We're going to use the water pump to pump antifreeze into the coach. Okay? You have to. There's no other way to get antifreeze in the unit. You have to use the water pump. So if you don't have this and you don't have that fancy panel, you have to locate the water pump and you have to unhook the suction side of the water pump on the face of the, there's a little drawing here. You guys can look at it after the seminar. I did not grab a water pump, I don't think. I don't have a water pump. On the, on the connection side of the water pump, there's actually an arrow on the face of it. On the plastic housing of the water pump, there's actually an arrow and it points. It's telling you which direction the water flows. So if the arrow is pointing this way, this side is the suction side. And this side is the output side because the arrow is pointing this way. So the, the, the pump is pushing this direction. So we unhook this side, hook up a hose to it, kind of like this. And the hose goes into the antifreeze. So the jug of antifreeze takes the place of your fresh water tank. This is now your fresh water tank. It just doesn't have fresh water in it. It's got antifreeze in it. And we're going to use the water pump to pump antifreeze through the system. Okay. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, no. you kind of answered it, but she was asking, because we have a small um, mount drum, mm -hmm. and it's got the Nautilus system outside, but we still need that little piece because there's no way of getting the fluid from the jug into the system. Yeah, you just need a, it's a great question. If you have that fancy little panel on the outside that allows you to do winterization that way, you need to take a junk garden hose that you have, and cut and don't get crazy about it. I, I ran into this personally this year. I have found an old hose over there and I made it for myself just for that purpose. And I made it about four feet long because I thought, well, why fight this hose? It was too long and I couldn't draw it out. I actually had to shorten the hose up, but that's the way to do it. Just take a fresh water hose, an old garden hose that you have, or you can buy small hoses too. You can buy like a four foot or a six foot hose. You just cut one end off of it so that you can hook up to your city water connection. The other end just goes into your jug. Just like you don't need the entire kit, you just need a hose. Right. This kit mounts on the inlet side of the water pump. In the event that you don't have the panel, you can mount this kit. And, and my, my motorhome that I have um, has a, a version of this that came from the factory that way. It's an, old, it's an old Winnebago, 98 Winnebago Adventure. And it has a version of this right there in, a, in an outside storage compartment. You need somehow, yes, to get out of the tank, draw it out of the tank, okay? Um, if you don't know where your water pump is and that's how you have to do it, then you just need to turn your water pump switch on. You'll hear it. I'm sure you guys have heard it before. It vibrates, makes a little bit of noise. And you just got to kind of wander through your unit until you, the, the noise gets loud and it's there somewhere. It's behind a false panel. It's behind a drawer. It's, it's somewhere in that area. And you might have to take some stuff apart. My motorhome before this one, I had to take a false shelf out of my lavvy in, my, in the bathroom. There was a, a, a shelf there that just kind of sat there on like some um, cleats. And you had to take that shelf out, and the water pump was under that shelf in the bathroom. So, um, I'm sorry? Um, about this long and maybe about that big around. Yeah, they're about that long. Yeah. So we have to find our water pump, okay? We're on number eight. Um, install the hose in the fitting and insert it into the antifreeze. And then we're going to go to the, um, we're going to bypass the water heater. 
okay? Again, newer units that are equipped with all this fancy stuff have a water heater bypass. Now in, that, in the instance of that panel that you guys have, when you winterize, it bypasses water heater. So this is not a step necessarily that you have to take. But there are, and my previous, actually my motorhome now has a water heater bypass. Okay, so I, I had mentioned um, that when, when, they plumb, when they plumb the RV, they have a cold line coming into the bottom of the water heater. That's your supply line, cold's coming in. Your hot comes out and feeds the hot side of your plumbing system. And it, it, especially today, um, and unless it's real old, uh, most manufacturers have put water heater bypasses in place. And it's just a line that goes between these two. So the line comes up and there's a T right before it gets to the bottom of the water heater. The T goes up and there's a T that's on the hot side. And there's a valve here. So you turn the valve one direction, it stops the water going into this tank, it goes up, and then it feeds the hot side without going into the water heater. In the event that there's a valve here, there's gonna be a check valve on the top here to prevent backfill on the top. So you're drawing antifreeze into your coach, it comes here, it hits this valve, doesn't go into the tank, goes up to the hot, it can't go into the tank because of a check valve here, and goes this way and goes to the hot side so that you can winterize the hot side. For what reason? So you don't need six gallons of antifreeze to winterize the hot side of your plumbing system because if you didn't have a bypass, you would have to fill this up with antifreeze to get antifreeze to the hot side. And we don't, want, we don't need six more gallons just to get to the hot side. All we need is a bypass, okay? And if you do not have one, they are available. There are several different versions, and this is it. So this is, the, this is the valve here. This is the cold line. A valve here turns a valve. Instead of going into the tank, it comes here, hits the valve, it goes up, it hits another valve, and that's the hot side and it goes that way. So this goes behind here, right here. And that's your bypass, okay? So that's what I said about turning your water heater to bypass position is, um, is, is and it even mentions in there, uh, if you do not have one, you need six more gallons. And I didn't mention this before, but I'll, I'll, I'll take the time now. Uh, typical antifreeze, or typical winterization is about two gallons of antifreeze. I use just shy of two. I had about maybe this much antifreeze left in my second gallon of antifreeze. Um, 33 foot class A motorhome, straight floor plan. One bathroom, one kitchen, one shower, one toilet. Just shy of two gallons, had maybe that much left in the second gallon. Uh, bigger units, second bathrooms, exterior kitchen, um, you might need a third, okay? Um, it's, there's no shelf life. It, it'll, if you get three and you don't open the third one, set it aside, you'll need it next year. So um, if you don't know, you could get three, it, it's fine for next year. Um, number 11, uh, if I'm going too fast or if anybody has any questions, just stop me. I'm trying to talk slow. If you guys, if you guys knew me, knew me, uh, we'd be done this seminar by now. I'm really <laughs> slowing up right now. <laughs> okay. Um, number 11, turn the water pump on and run antifreeze through all your faucets. So now, of course, I, most I'm sure everybody knows, uh, an RV water pump is a demand pump. Um, it, you, it comes on when there's a demand for something, in this particular case, antifreeze. And then when there's no more demand, the pump shuts off. So we put the, we put the draw tube in the antifreeze, we got the bypass in the bypass position, we got everything closed back up. We find our water pump switch. Our water pump switch is usually in the kitchen maybe on a monitor panel, something like that, you know? So we turn the water pump switch on and it's probably gonna immediately start to draw. We haven't done anything but turn the switch on. There's no, there's a demand. There's nothing in the plumbing system. So don't be alarmed that antifreeze is going somewhere, dumping out on your bathroom floor or something. 
it, there's a demand because the plumbing system is entirely empty right now. So it's going to start drawing until it pressurizes the system. It's going to go path of least resistance. It's going where it can until the pressure is maxed out on the pump because there's a pressure switch on the pump. It's going to say, that's enough, I'm, I'm pressurized. So you might see a quart or maybe even a half a gallon of antifreeze disappear and you haven't even done anything but turn the switch on. Okay, which is fine. That's what you want. You want it to go in. Okay. Um, so then you go to the kitchen faucet. Same drill so as you did when you got the when you had air put uh, air air to it and we're trying to get the water out. Now you want the antifreeze there. So go to the kitchen faucet. If it's a single lever, go to cold. Watch. You'll it'll spit at you and pop at you because there's air in the line until it runs solid pink. You're done. As soon as it runs solid pink, you're done. Go to hot. Same thing's going to happen. It's going to hiss and pop and spit at you because there's air in the line on the hot side. And then it's solid pink, you're done. Should you start at the highest point, like in our fifth wheel or bathrooms up there toward where the, the master suite is and stuff, and then out the back of the toy hall part, there's a half a bath there. Mm -hmm. He's asking about where to start, if there's any kind of sequence. Does it matter whether you're further or closer or higher or lower? Um, you know, interestingly enough, I've been doing this forever, and uh, I've never had that particular question asked. I don't think it matters. Um, it might, the winterization process might go quicker or might be easier or less complicated if you would do one over the other. But I think eventually you'll get there. I don't think that there's, I, you're, you're not going to miss any, if you, if, you, if you don't overlook any place, I don't think it matters where you start and where you finish. It's the same plumbing system. Um, there's only one inlet. It's the city water inlet is the very start of your plumbing system. Any RV, that is the very start. And that tees to the pump and that tees to the line and that tees to the exterior, that, they, it tees everywhere. But if you could actually just see the plumbing system laying here, it's just one continuous line and that's where it starts. So I, I think eventually it'll get there. Whether it's more convenient or quicker might make a difference and that might just take some experimental, you know, on your, on your point. But I, I, eventually I think you'll get there and I, think, I don't think it matters at all. Yeah, that's a good question. So we go to every place that they're where every place again. We walk through the coach again. We flush the toilet, and we make sure that there's pink water running in the toilet. We we do the shower, um, we do the exterior shower, we do the outside kitchen, we do the bath and a half. But we do everything. We it runs pink. Remember, you're, you're you you need two gallons. You're going to run out pretty quick on the first one. You sucked a half a gallon of it in before you even started. So that that next half gallon is going to go pretty quick and then it's not going to pump anymore. You're going to be done. You kind of got to watch that. Replace that jug with the second gallon, pump the second gallon in. You probably only get about halfway through that sec in a conventional unit. You're probably only going to get about halfway through that second gallon and you're done. Unless it's a big unit with a lot of stuff. Okay. All right. Number 12 on the back. It talks about ice makers and washing machines, number 12 and 13. So um, if you have an ice maker, that gets a little complicated, okay? Um, and no, I'm not nuts because I'm going to winter, winterize ice. Uh, uh, no, I'm serious. You got you to gotta winterize your ice maker. I'm serious. Um, there's, a, there's a cold water plumbing line going to your ice maker, okay? So that's what you're winterizing. No, you're not winterizing your ice maker. You're winterizing the water line that goes to your ice maker, okay? That can be a little complicated. There's a solenoid, and as you can imagine, if you could, if you could take, the, the ice maker's probably a half or a quarter of the size of a conventional residential ice maker. It's a little tiny thing, right? And if you could actually, if you actually took that one tray of ice and put it back in a cup 
to see how much water was in, you'd probably have about this much water in a cup, right? And that line between the supply and the ice maker might be 15 or 20 feet long. So the moral of that story is if you want to winterize your ice maker yourself, you probably don't have the cool little gadgets we do where we can bypass the solenoid and make it run wide open. You're going to have to make pink ice, okay? You're going to have to make slush in your ice maker, all right? And that's going to take three or four series of ice because the ice tray is going to dump and it's going to run. And that 25-foot water line, you're going to get about three feet of antifreeze down here and you're still going to have 15 feet of water here. So then you got to make a second tray of ice and a third and you get the idea. That cycle might have to go for 24 hours or so and make three or four or five trays of ice. So it might just have to sit. That's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's not an efficient way for us to winterize the line that goes to the ice maker, but that may be your only choice. Um, we have this cool little gadget. It's, uh, it's, it looks kind of like a plug, because it is. <laughs> This right here, uh, we can take two wires off of it, and on a 110, if it's a 110 ice maker, we can take these two wires and plug this in, and we can touch the terminals of the solenoid, it runs wide open, and it'll pump antifreeze into the, into the freezer, okay? Makes a, makes a serious mess, and then you just clean it up. You do the same thing with 12 volt, only you don't use 110, so if it's a 12-volt solenoid, you use 12-volt power, but you do the same thing. You take two 12-volt wires, one on the hot and one on the ground on a battery, and touch the 12-volt solenoid. Solenoid runs until antifreeze is in the freezer, okay? That's the way to do it, and you can do that, but if, you don't, if you're unsure what you're doing, be careful. Make sure you know what you're doing, because the solenoid's not cheap, and you might burn it up. So be careful if you're doing it that way. But the bottom line is that you do, have to, you do have to winterize the water line that goes to your ice maker. And then the same holds true if you've got a washer dryer. Um, no, we're not going to winterize the dryer, uh, but we are going to winterize the washing machine. And you have to run a washing machine on, and we do have to do this too. There's no way around this one. Um, no secrets, no tricks. You've got to run through a wash cycle on warm while you're hooked up to, while you, while you got your line in the antifreeze jug, you got to do a, a warm cycle so that you draw antifreeze through the hot and the cold line to the washing machine. Um, then you have to let it pump out because you need antifreeze in the washer pump. And that's going to also winterize your trap. And speaking of which, you might have already concluded that everything that we're doing is winterizing your traps. Because when, you, when you're at your kitchen sink and you're running pink on your cold and then on your hot, antifreeze is going into your sink and it's going straight into the trap. And it's, it's, it's diluting the water that's in your trap. It's not pure antifreeze, but it's diluted. Pure antifreeze is good to 50 below, okay? We'll probably never see that here in this region, okay? And if you guys are going to the inside the Arctic Circle with your RV, you got bigger problems than antifreeze, let me tell you. Uh, I'm just telling you. Uh, so, um, um, but you're getting, you're getting antifreeze in your traps, and then there's a little bit of antifreeze going into your holding tanks, your black tank and your gray tank. Let me make sure they're empty, of course. Empty them when you're done your last trip. I'm sure everybody does, but just a reminder. Empty your tanks, and then you get a little bit of antifreeze in your tank, too. In case there's any residual water in the holding tanks, then it kind of dilutes it, okay? So um, there's some macerator pumps out there. Um, they're not on the list. They're not very common, but there are macerator pumps. They need winterized. Um, I already mentioned uh, like exterior kitchens and stuff like that. Um, oh, what are the ads? Um, I think that's about it. So as far as antifreeze and winterization is concerned, that pretty much takes care of anything uh, as far as getting antifreeze to everything in a unit. All right, number four. To, oh, go ahead. One quick question. Yeah. In the bathroom, like mm -hmm. the shower has like one of those. You can pull the shower head. It has like uh, the, the tube. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Should we unscrew it? You can. Like drain 
you you can. It's just screwed to the di diverter valve at the at the. If you have a, a tub shower diverter at the bottom, or just even a shower spout, or even just the diverter itself, that can be unhooked. Yeah, it's just it just twists that off. You can. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure enough. Yep. All right. Number fourteen is turn the bypass valve back to normal position, or reconnect the lines of the water heater and the pump. Okay. So we're going to turn the water heater bypass back to normal operation. Does two things, okay? Um, there's another demand, right? The water pump sees a demand. When we turn that valve back, that tank's empty and there's a demand. So the water pump comes back on. When you turn this back to normal operation, there's a demand. Remember we mentioned a minute ago, she asked the question, there's, a, there's still water laying in the bottom of this. I can't drain, sorry. I can't drain all the water because here's the drain and here's the tank, the bottom of the tank. I got about a half a gallon of water laying in here, pure water. So I'm gonna turn the water heater bypass back to normal. There's a demand for it, takes that remaining little bit of antifreeze that we have left and puts it into the water heater tank, okay? Um, the other thing that that does for everybody is it puts your coach back in normal operation. It's October. You're gonna go camping in April. I don't remember what I did this morning, let alone what I did six months ago. So you go camping in the spring, you're ready to roll. You don't have to worry about, you don't, you don't get to the campground and set everything up and then go to take a shower eight hours later and have a cold shower because your bypass is still in bypass. Because that's what will happen. If your bypass is left in bypass, you're taking a cold shower because there's nothing in the tank. And you might burn up your element when you turn your breaker back on. So, so turn your water heater back to normal operation, uh, the bypass. Um, we're gonna put the water pump back into the right position. Um, number 16 says uh, pump antifreeze through your city water inlet. Now there is a pump available. This is a hand pump. I guess this, they did this way back in the day before we had water pumps and stuff. There's actually a hand pump that you can pump through your city water connection. Your city water connection has a check valve in it too, okay? So when you actually hook up the city water, water goes into your coach, but it can't come back. If you, unhooked, if you unhooked your hose after you were done camping and there was water in your coach, you'd wear it because it'd come back out. There's a check valve in there, and that check valve holds water. So it's, it's suggested that you winterize that check valve so it doesn't freeze and break, okay? Um, you can push the, if you take the screen out, you can push on it and relieve the pressure, a little bit of water will come out of it. That's probably not the best solution, but it is one way to get some of the water out of it. Um, if you don't want to buy the pump, because they're about 25 or $30, if you don't want to buy a pump, or maybe you and a bunch of friends can go together and just buy one and share it. Um, or you could take a city water hose, just like, like you're gonna hook up, Make sure it's empty, doesn't have any water in it. Take an empty city water hose and you could funnel the remaining, some, some remaining water that you have in the hose and then hook that up to a hose bib and then turn the hose on for a couple seconds. Don't do it long, but you can do it for a couple seconds and it'll push that antifreeze through the check valve. Okay, you follow me there? Put a, put a quarter, a pint, a pint of antifreeze in the hose first hook it up to your hose bib, the water will push the antifreeze through the city water connection, okay? You also have city water, yeah, go ahead. I'm just that, are you saying that you cannot use that pump with the, the stuff in it? You cannot use that not, no, you cannot. The question is, can you use the water pump to winterize your city water connection? You cannot because your water pump is inside the plumbing system where the city water connection is. The city water connection is the very first, that's the start of the plumbing system. And then inside the coach is a water pump. So the pump is going beyond this way and this way. So the city water connection that's on the outside of the coach is what I'm referring to now. Now, I probably shouldn't say this too loud because I might get in trouble, but 
Um, a city water connection, pretend that you forgot, or maybe you just are going to forget about it. And they're like five bucks. A city water connection is like five bucks. So if you do, if you do forget and it freezes, all that's going to happen in the spring probably is you're going to hook up your city water connection and it's probably going to drip. You're not going to be able to get it tight enough because it's going to drip behind because it froze and, and broke and it's going to drip. That's probably about all that's going to happen. Okay? And they're not very expensive. So if you truly do forget or you can't get it winterized and something happens to it, um, they're not that expensive to replace. Okay? All right. Um, black tank, it mentions the black tank flush. The black tank flush is another city water connection. It just doesn't go into city water, it goes into the black tank. Same exact fitting. It's got a check valve too, for the same reason. You don't want that stuff coming back out at you. So it's got a check valve in it too. So anywhere that you can hook up a hose to the outside, there's a check valve behind it, okay? And then there's a, it makes mention there about um, cleaning it up, especially when um, um, it's left in like a poor, on a poor surface, like on the bottom of a shower pan that's kind of rough, you know, it's kind of a poor surface, um, it will stain. I mentioned earlier, it's dye. There's dye, that pink, the pink part of it is dye. And it will stain. If you have a white shower pan and you let the air freeze in there and you go back six months later, you're likely to have a pink shower pan, okay? So you want to clean it up because it can stain, okay? All right? We're winterized. That's all there is to it. So who's looking for a job? Because I got about a thousand of them coming at me. <laughs> we did 700 winterizations last year. And with the sales that we had this year, I'm probably thinking it's probably going to be more like a thousand winterizations this year. So, um, yeah. How much do you all charge? Uh, great question. Uh, we charge $129.95 for a winter, standard winterization. There are some $10 ads. I mentioned them, a macerator pump. If you do not have a water heater bypass, we will put eight gallons of antifreeze in the coach to winterize it but then we have a recapturing tank that we use. So after we winterize, if you do not have a bypass, after we winterize, we will actually drain the antifreeze out, back out of the water heater and recapture it. Um, we don't charge you for it. We don't charge you for the antifreeze, but we charge you an extra $10 to do it because it does take a little bit more time, okay? Um, this seminar is free. Uh, we do offer a winterization 101 with our winterization. Um, it's $49. Um, if you want to join us winterizing the unit, um, it takes us more time, and unfortunately we have to charge you for that time. But you can, you, we, you can go with a technician and do the winterization with them um, for $49 extra. And we will show you exactly what I just told you. You will get to see step by step. So, any other questions about winterization? Let me check my props here and see if I missed anything. Um, do, the, I have one of these and I use that, typically I use this in the spring, not in the fall, but I'll just talk about it since it's laying here. I talked about those contaminants in the water heater tank, okay? Um, they, they can sometimes, especially over time, uh, create odors. So you might have hot water that stinks, okay? This is a great little gadget to buy and flush out your water heater tank. Because remember, how, you know how it's valleyed and you can't get everything out? So you hook this up to your garden hose and stick that in where your drain is and turn it around like this and it'll spray the inside of your tank. And again, it's gonna come out at you, so wear old clothes or don't, if you don't mind getting wet, because you're probably gonna get wet. But you'll see all the calcium and stuff, just like you see in your house when like an aerator gets clogged up or something. That stuff will be laying in the bottom of your tank. Um, this is a good little gadget to keep, clean, keep your water heater tank clean. I do it in the spring, okay, because it's got antifreeze in it. Uh, my, my water heater has antifreeze now, so it doesn't matter now. 
but in the spring when I dewinterize, um, I got to open up that plug and flush the whole system out. And when I do, I'll grab my garden hose and just kind of squirt the inside of the tank out so that I clean up the tank. I do that in the spring, okay? Um, if you don't have a tank flush, I have one of these too. Um, if you don't have a tank flush, this is a wand um, that you can actually put down into the toilet and you can see the little spinner thing on it. The water comes down through this wand and goes this way, sprays this way, and it spins. So there's water going like this inside the holding tank. Um, so that's a, that's a good way to flush your tank. Again, um, that's probably more appropriate to do that the last trip of the year because you're, hopefully you're at a campground where you have a full hookup and you can do this stuff the last, do it there instead of doing it at your house. You really don't have any, I mean, I, I do fortunately, ha I have a clean out in my front yard. So I, I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, I don't, I'm not like on a city street block, but I live where I have city sewer and I have a clean out in my front yard so I can dump my tanks at my house. So, uh, which is real, real convenient. Um, uh, but this will clean out your um, holding tank. And let's talk about holding tank for a second. Um, there's some stuff here that I would recommend you guys do. Um, this is level gauge cleaner. Most everything today has a monitor panel that allows you to monitor the levels of your tanks. Not just fresh water, but your gray water and your black water. And the, it's a real simple system. It's, it's, it's 12 volt system. It's, it's, it's grounds, it's, pot, it's, it's, it's power and ground, okay? So the side of a holding tank has a ground lug screwed through it and it's got a wire hooked up to it and then near it, it's got one, a probe on the bottom and then a probe at one third and then a probe at two thirds and then a probe at, at full. And I, you saw I did that at an angle. They don't put them up and down for, so that there's, it's less likely for anything to get toilet paper primarily, toilet paper to get caught up on those probes so they kind of spread them out on the tank. So you got a ground over here and you got a hot wire right here. And when, that, when those two make a connection, it lights up your light on your monitor panel, right? When the, when, the, when the circuit is connected, then it lights up the monitor panel. So then as that tank fills up and gets to the one third, now we got a ground over here and we got one third. Now it's telling us, hey, we got a one third, okay? If crud gets on those probes, your tank's completely empty, dry, completely empty. But if there's something on those probes that are making the monitor panel think that there's a connection there, you're gonna get a false reading at your monitor panel, okay? So this stuff called level gauge cleaner, some, it's granular, okay? This is about two uses. They use about half of this bottle. The instructions are on here. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't try to sell anything that I don't use. So I'm telling you, it's, the, the stuff that I have up here is the stuff that I use pretty regularly. Uh, not only in this, not only in my own application, but we even use this stuff in the shop environment when a customer says, my monitor panel's not reading right. And it might just be this, okay? It might just be crud in the tank, okay? Um, so if you put this in and let it soak for 24 hours, let it sit, fill up the tank with water, just stand on the toilet pedal till the tank's full of water, put the half of this in there and let it sit for 24 hours and then dump your tanks. You can also, if you have the opportunity to, you might want to take a little joy ride and let it slosh around in the tank, okay? Um, but this is, this is some good stuff for your holding tanks. And, you know, I, I talk about this because that's not a very friendly camping environment when you have odor from your tank. And this really helps. This, it really, really helps to keep your tanks clean. So a couple other things, valve, valve lube. Um, tissue digester. There's some other stuff up here, but I, I, this is one that I certainly would recommend as necessary. Um, uh, I don't know if there's anything else really there specifically I need to talk to. Anything else about winterization? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we have a, a heating system, uh -huh. and then there's a water heater. It also heats the water. That's correct. Yeah, and I'm not that familiar with those Aldi, those Instahots and stuff like that, so I'm, I would encourage you to read your owner's manual about exactly those steps to do the winterization on that. Uh, there's, they're a little tricky because it's also a heater. So, yeah. Right, yeah. All right, so um, there, the, there's some other things here that I'll just touch on real quick because I don't want to burn your whole afternoon. 
But I got, there's, this is an, actually a 10 page handout of some stuff that we've accumulated over the years. Actually, um, if, if, for those of you that know Paul Chamberlain, the Air Force guy that works here, um, uh, the, the bulk of these handouts are his that he did several years ago and I stole them from him because I thought they were awesome for, our, for, for this purpose. Um, it talks about cold weather camping, so there's some helpful hints in there for cold weather camping. Um, you can camp in colder weather. There might be some precautions that you need to take to camp in, in, in uh, colder weather. Um, you know that it's, and I, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but know that it's not a residence as far as construction is concerned. I'll give you an example. Um, you're, you're the, a house on a, uh, the, the R factor on a, on a residential house might be R18, R20, R22, something like that. You know, your roof gets up into the 20s and 30s in your floor because of how much insulation you have in a residence, okay? Let me tell you, let me just give you an analogy so you know, okay? Uh, the average wall on a recreational vehicle is around R7, okay? And I'll, I'll take it one step further. Um, there's, some there's some dual pane windows out there, but not, not as much as you might think. Most RVs have single strength glass, single pane glass, okay? A three foot square piece of single strength glass, okay? Which they exist. There's picture windows in some of these units. There's windows that are about that size, okay? Single strength, anybody want to take a guess what a single strength piece of glass is that's three feet square? R, huh? Close, R1, R1. Single strength piece of, that's a great guess. And you, I led you a little bit. <laughs> so if you have a single strength piece of glass, three feet square, it's R1, okay? So, so know what you're getting into. I'm not trying to discourage you from camping in colder weather, okay? Because it's very enjoyable. If you like colder weather, it's, it's great. You know, it's campfires and stuff like that, right? But there's some stuff there for cold weather camping. Condensation is another thing. The next page is about condensation. You will experience that too it's for the same reason. It's the same reason. It's because of our factor. Okay, you have significant temperature changes between the two and you don't have a whole lot of protection between the two. And as a result, you're gonna experience excessive condi could, you could experience excessive condensation, okay? Uh, critter deterrence, uh, we do have some stuff. I, 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 I kinda, again, um, the stuff's kind of expensive. I just sold two boxes of this across the street earlier today. Um, service department's open until lunchtime during the week, or on Saturdays. And a customer just bought this earlier today. Two boxes, that was like 35 bucks. I bought two boxes too. I know how expensive it is. Um, and I, I swear by it. About four or five years ago, I had terrible mice problems at the house, in both my house and in the RV. My RV sits right beside my house. I got a little pad there beside the house and I had terrible mice. So, um, I, and we were started selling this. So I got it and I put it in the um, RV and I also put traps because I thought, well, I'll put some traps just in case, right? So it was much better, but I still caught mice. So I was just BSing with somebody, a, a, a customer, then maybe later or the next spring or the next fall or something, I was BSing about it. And I told him what I had done and he goes, well, you goofball, you put bait inside the coach. So I eliminated the traps. The next year, I took the traps out completely. And all I did was put four of these tea bags in my motorhome. Didn't have a single mouse in my motorhome. Still had them in my house, not in my motorhome. Wasn't a single mouse in my home. I could not, I'll put it this way. I did not find any evidence of any mice in my motorhome the following year and have not. I've done it every year. I don't have any evidence of mice in my motorhome anymore. I still catch a occasion, you know, a few in my house, but this stuff's great. It's expensive, but it works. How long, does, how long do they last generally? Like, because I have a scent, I can smell it. Yep. You know, I just didn't know. Like they, um, I think it says on here that, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think it says that they last too long. Uh, I don't, I don't, rep I do it once and call it a day. 
I, I don't. I remember reading it, but I don't remember. Huh? I, that that sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. Three months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a little bleep in here about sanitizing your fresh water system. There's a kit here. Uh, this isn't my favorite. I'll be perfectly honest. They, they, they brought these props out for me today. This is a two-part system where you actually clean and sanitize your plumbing system. It's kind of tedious and time-consuming. It takes a while. It works great. It just takes like a half a day. It really foams up your water and it's just, it just, it's, it's just really, it, it's time-consuming and cumbersome and I just, I, I'm impatient. I just can't, I can't deal with it. There's another, there's another bottle up there that I use. It's a bottle that's only about this big around. It looks like about, looks like a, pardon my analogy, looks like a long neck beer bottle. About that, it's about that shape and size, about that big around. It's just, um, it's just water treatment. And I use that every time I put water in my fresh water tank, I put it, it's like, a, it's like about a 16 ounce bottle. I pour that in there. My fresh water tank is 100 gallons, but I only put about 50 in. I usually have fill about half full. Um, I'll put one bottle to 50 gallons of uh, fresh water every time, religiously. My, I, I never have any odor with my water. It's, it's always clean. There's, uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's, it's got, it's chlor there's some chlorine in it. It's not bad. It's not overpowering or anything. You can sanitize your tank with actual chlorine. Um, if you're going to do that, you need to be very careful about how much you use, just because it's overpowering. A uh, one cap, one cap of Clorox to a gallon of water. That's all you need. If you're actually going to use Clorox to treat your fresh water system, you can use it. It's okay, um, uh, but you don't need much. One cap per gallon. Okay. Um, the next page is something that I put together years ago, and I, I wish I'd have thought about it before my seminar because a lot of this stuff is outdated, but some of it is actually still very pertinent. And the, um, the first thing is about sealants. I see sealant inspections and sealant issues with units in, in, uh, um, from a water intrusion standpoint all the time. We've, we're, we're rebuilding the floor of a passport over there right now. It's a 2018 passport. Um, we traded it, it was used. Um, we traded in, used, and found it, discovered it after we, after we owned it again. It was a three-year-old unit. The, the floor is rotten from the back bumper clear to the axle. It's completely destroyed. It's been leaking probably for two years. It's probably been leaking. It's three years old. It's probably been leaking for two years. And it's because of sealant deterioration. And it's, it's just really bad. It can be really bad. So inspect your sealants. We'll inspect your sealants for you. It's a minimal fee for some safeguards. This is probably going to be five or six thousand dollars worth of repair on this particular unit, and and we own it, so we're we're paying for it this time. But if you owned it, it's five or six thousand dollars worth of repair that you would have to do in order to make the floor right again. Floor's rotten. Um, Battery level, these are not main, most batteries are not maintenance free. Deep cycle or uh, deep cell marine batteries, deep cycle batteries um, are not, the standard batteries that we put in them are not maintenance free. They, you need distilled water, you need to make sure that they have water in them. When water dissipates in a battery, they overheat. There's plates in a battery. You have positive and negative plates in a battery alternating in the cells, right? You have six cells, really. Um, and you have a, a positive plate beside a negative plate in each of those six. And when that battery heats up, those cells can swell, or the, the plates can swell. And when a positive plate and a negative plate touch, they short out. Now you only have five cells. So now you have 87%, a fully charged battery with one bad cell is only 87%. So you get the idea. When it dries out and it heats up and that stuff swells, if two or three of them do it, now your fully charged battery is only a half a battery because three of the six are bad, okay? So check your water level regularly. 
they're going to last you. They're, they, they, they're, 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 they're exposed to a pretty harsh environment. So um, they might last you four or five years. I just changed mine out. I did it five years ago. I just did it again this year. So um, if you take care of them and keep watering them, they should last you for four or five years, maybe longer. But um, batteries are, the, the house side of your batteries are exposed to some tremendous amount of um, um, unfavorable treatment. Um, lug nuts, torquing lug nuts, that's, that's, a, that's on the towable side. Motorized is not nearly as important because motorhomes steer on an arc, trailers do not. So when you're towing a trailer, if you've ever seen it or if you want to look the next time you're towing your trailer, take a real hard turn in a parking lot or something like that and look over your shoulder and look at your axles and you'll see your tires are like this. They're twisted really bad. Tra trailer tires are side by side. And when you get into a real hard turn, they really put side, really put a lot of tremendous side load pressure on the lug nuts, depending upon which way you turn. And that can loosen up your lug nuts over time. And loose lug nuts, when you're traveling down the road, if your lug nuts are loose, and then you have to get onto a hard brake, your hub's gonna stop before the tire does, and it'll shear your lug studs off. I've seen it happen. I, we were actually in a lawsuit when I worked my previous life, when I worked with Fleetwood, we were at the company Fleetwood was actually sued because that happened to a customer and the customer said it's warranty and I said no it's not and he hired an attorney and sued us and we took him to court and we won the case Fleetwood won the case it's not a warranty scenario when you shear off your lug studs it, that's a that's a lug nut maintenance thing you need to make sure your lug nuts are properly um, torqued um, repacking wheel bearings that kind of goes uh, without saying Lubing stuff up. We talked about cleaning, holding tanks, sanitizing, um, awnings. Uh, I'm going to talk about awnings for a second. Um, um, awnings are, I'll say it black and white first, and then I'll get into a little bit of a variable. An awning is for shade, period, the end, okay? Your awning is for shade. Um, now, if, if it's drizzling out, of course, it, it provides a little bit of protection. If it's a, a, a pounding thunderstorm, I'm not sure that you can count on these self-dumping things, and I'm not sure that you want to take the chance, and I'm not sure that enough angle is enough. If it's a really hard downpour and wind, your awning might collapse. It's, it's not intended to be able to handle that kind of harsh environment. It's just not. And even if, it, even if the manufacturer um, advertises that it's got some sort of self-dump feature, it's got a gas strut on it or something, and as the, as the awning fills up with water and starts to get heavy, one of the gas struts will collapse and the awning will go this way and it'll drain. They kind of work, but I, I don't, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know that I would recommend that. And the reason that's on the list, that, that, that paper there I, I put together probably eight or ten years ago, um, right, at, right before I put that paper together, we had an insurance estimate across the street. Had an electric awning that was left out in the storm, and a storm tore it apart. And it was a full paint Class A motorhome, and it was a, a nine thousand dollar insurance claim. And the awning is only about seven hundred bucks. Guess what the rest of it was? The rest of it was paint, because it was a full paint unit, and it broke the arms up. And the arms did this on the side of the coach through the whole storm and, and, and go look at the paint. If you got, I know you know, if you guys have ever walked our lot, look at some of them fancy class A paint jobs on there. They got swirls and circles and all di four different colors and it goes all over the place and these scratches went all over the place. And the awning was probably Counting labor, the awning was probably 1500 of that $9,000 insurance estimate. So be careful with your awning, okay? Um, uh, it talks about a couple other things there. Really nothing much. All right. Um, safety first. There's, a, there's one thing. Oh, there is a deep cycle handout in there, deep, deep cycle battery thing in there that um, gives a little bit more of an explanation than I did, as you can read. Um, Tire pressure, I want to talk about tire pressure. This is inclusive, this is everybody. Tire pressure um, is so, so important. Um, um, I did a lot of, uh, I, uh, I got to know Bob Horton pretty well. Bob Horton was an engineer in Goodyear back in the uh, uh, early, mid 90s when I worked for a manufacturer in, in Nebraska. And we were having tire issues. 
and, um, and we couldn't figure it out at Fleetwood. And um, I made some phone calls and the product, the product manager made some phone calls and we finally got a hold of this guy named Bob Horton. And he was an engineer at Goodyear. And um, I still have his business card, believe it or not. And um, um, I learned a lot about tires. And tires, tires are so much more simple regarding failure than you might think. Um, there's really only a couple things that are going to affect your tires. All right? Age is going to affect your tires. Tires will age out at about seven years. RV tires usually don't wear out. Automotive tires wear out. We put miles on our car. They will wear out before they age out. You'll put tires on your car every, unless it just sits, you'll put, if, you, if, it's, a, if it's your regular commuter, you're probably gonna put tires on your car every four or five years, right? Okay, you don't wear out a tire in an RV. You just don't. Um, they don't get enough, they don't get enough tra you know, um, uh, traffic. They don't, they don't get enough use. So tires will age out at about seven years. Yours truly, I'm sitting here telling you my horror stories. Shame on Keith, I, I know better, right? You're probably thinking, and he's given the seminar on winterization. Um, um, I, two years ago, I went to Virginia Beach on 11 year old tires and I'm, I didn't make it to Richmond and had a tire blowout. So, um, I got roadside assistance to come and it paid for about half of it. And I was about five hours later than I wanted to get there because I'm sitting along Interstate 95 with a tire blowout. And um, um, so I put two tires on the front of that motorhome and put the, I put the four best tires on the back. Next year, which was last year, that was 2018. 2019, I went to Virginia Beach, two brand new tires on the front, had another tire blow out on the back, two years in a row. And it's not because you looked at them, they, they, they look like tires that you see in a, in, a tire, in a showroom of a tire shop. I mean, that's, they just look that good. But they were 11 years old, and 12, 11 and 12. The 11 year old one blew out and then the 12 year old blew out. So, so age is one thing, okay? Um, Road hazard, you can't, you can't avoid, right? You're gonna have, if you run over something and it punctures your tire, you're gonna have a tire blow out. That's just, you just, that's just the nature of it, right? Okay, there's only one more thing that's gonna cause tires to blow out, one more. Does anybody know what one more is? Well, but it's what causes the, what, it's, it's the tire pressure causes something to cause the tire blow out. Heat, heat. Is the only, that's the only other thing that's gonna cause a tire to fail, is heat. And heat is created by tire pressure, either too much or too, or, or, uh, too little of tire pressure causes heat. The other thing that causes heat is overload. You can have your tire maxed out. And when you, tie, when you max out your tire, if, it's, if your sidewall says 50 PSI is a 2,500 pound load, and it'll tell you right on the sidewall, 50 PSI max cold is 2,500 load range. That's max. If you put 3,500 pounds on that tire and it's rated for 25 and 50, it doesn't matter. You're gonna overload the tire and it's gonna create excessive heat and it's gonna blow out, okay? So, and I have a thought, I have a, I wanted to just touch upon that because I, I have a handout in here too about weights. It's, I think it's the last page. And it talks about weights. And I encourage you to know what your unit weighs if you're not, especially towables. Uh, uh, motorized, not so much. Uh, motorized are intended to handle a lot of weight just because of what they are. But in the towable world, um, it's sometimes, I'll give, let me tell you a story. It's a funny story. When I worked in Omaha, Nebraska at uh, Fleetwood, we had a customer that called us from, um, I think she was in Birmingham, out, she was in, I think Birmingham, it was in Alabama, and we're in Omaha, Nebraska. She calls me and says, my pin box is pushing up into the cap. Big fifth wheel, big heavy fifth wheel. Uh, we built high-end fifth wheels back in the 90s at Fleetwood. We were ahead of our time. They're everywhere now, they're awesome now. We built them then and it was a complete flop because nobody wanted to spend $65,000 on a fifth wheel. And now that's about average, but 
Um, so big, heavy, high, high end, triple slide, fifth wheel, 95, 96, 97 era. Um, her name was Amelia, uh, um, Amelia Zerbini. She called me and she was in Alabama and she said the pin box, you know how a pin box sticks out of the fifth wheel? She said the pin box is, looks like it's breaking loose and pushing up into the cap. And I said, really? I said, send me some pictures. Now this is, oh, I kind of already told you my age, right? By, by my experience. I said, send me a picture. Well, guess what she FedExed me because we didn't have digital pictures. She FedExed me a Polaroid picture, <laughs> okay? And the pin box is smashed up into the cap and I'm like, I'm freaking out. How can that be? So I talked to the general, ma general manager of the plant. We sent a low boy down to Alabama, pulled it up on a low boy, hauled it back to the plant where we built it. And I walked inside and the driver that picked it up said she was unloading stuff when we were there. She was filling up, she was filling up her pickup truck bed with stuff. I said, huh. So I opened up the door of this fifth wheel. And I, I, this is no exaggeration. There is clothes and costumes and stuff sitting on furniture this high. There's an aisle, and I'm not a big guy. There's an aisle that about I can fit through in this thing. There is stuff everywhere, okay? So that particular unit, and my, my memory's fading because of age, but I'm, I'm gonna say, I'll use round numbers, because this, this is real close. Round numbers, that fifth wheel grossed out. Gross vehicle weight rating, and that's why I wanted to talk. I got, I got all of the weight things here, so gross vehicle weight rating on that unit was about 16,000 pounds, okay? That's gross. We weighed it. It weighed over 19,000 pounds. She had overloaded it by 3,000 pounds, okay? So the moral of that story is, is that um, a typical camper is probably not going to put a whole lot of stuff in it. Um, it's kind of the analogy, you know, what, what weighs more, steel or feathers, right? Well, they all weigh the same. A pound of, a pound of steel and a pound of feathers is the same. But there's a whole lot more feathers, right, than there is steel when you're talking about a pound to a pound. And that's what you're putting in your unit. You're putting in a bunch of feathers. But the feathers are going to add up, okay? So if you're tight on your margins, because sometimes these manufacturers get kind of tight. The dry weight might be 10,000 and the gross vehicle weight might be 12,000. That means you've got 2,000 pounds to play with, okay? And if you're going for longer trips, if you've got, I mean, I, I travel some, I raised five children. Four of them are grown and gone, but there have been times in not too distant past where there's been six adults in that motorhome. And six adults take six adults stuff. It's six changes of clothes times a week, and it's, it's six of everything. So, and that stuff adds up. You know, six lawn chairs, it's six of everything. So, if, if you have some tight numbers on there, I would encourage you to know what your unit weighs. You can pull across the scale and get a weight on it. You can do Flying J, the cat scales, you can pull one of those. For a little bit of nothing, you can get your unit weighed. It's just a good thing to know. Because if you are getting, if you are close, or certainly, God forbid, if you're over, you need to make some precautions there. You can always go up on a load range of tire. That's not the only part of the equation. But you can go, like if you have an E-rated tire, you could go to an F or a G-rated tire. That'll give you more tire. It, it still doesn't change the rating of the coach because they look at everything. They look at steel and the axle and all that other stuff too. It's not just tires, but the tires are probably the main factor. And if you have four tires that are rated for 3,000 pounds a piece, that's 12,000 pounds. And if, you're, if you have 12,500, you might need to go up another range, a tire range. I, and, and the reason I say that in firsthand experience, it just sucks being alongside the road with a tire blowout in an RV. And if you can prevent it, prevent it. I don't have anything else. If you guys have anything, uh, um, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. So we have the little time max.
Now, do you, do you have a winterization kit installed, or do you, so, so you, you have one of these little gadgets with the tube and stuff? No. It's just, well, that will help. So this little winterization kit you can put on the inlet side of your water pump, and that just lays inside that compartment. You, no, this just lays inside that compartment, and there's just a little valve to turn. You don't have to unhook anything. Yep, right here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anything? Any anything random? Yeah, go ahead. Well, the owner's manual. The owner's manual. There should be something in your owner's manual. It may be generic. It, it may not be as thorough as what you need in order to determine what exactly the problem is. Um, um, I'm not sure about you guys, but Google is my best friend, and um, I, 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 I mean. If you have a model, if you have the model number, if you get the model number off of the little data label, model number, um, um, service manual, something like that, maybe even put the name, the brand name, model number, brand name, service manual in Google, there's a good chance you're going to find it. And, and a service manual is different than an owner's manual. Uh, that's, you know, obviously, that's what we need over there in service is we need a service manual. So that might give you some troubleshooting steps and stuff like that. Man, I, I, I am, in today's world, I have found myself, and I, I'm, I'm not very IT literate, you know, I'm not very computer savvy, but it's pretty easy for me. And if I can do it, probably you know, anybody can find that stuff, yeah. Well, like well um, I, I can promise you this. Um, 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 we'll do what we can. Uh, um, it's very rare that somebody would call us and say, I'm leaving Thursday, and this isn't working, and I need help. Very, very, very rare. It's got to be some really unique circumstances. I mean, if, if, if I'll give you a silly example. If you ran over a log and ripped the axle out from underneath your trailer, and you said, hey, I need to get in Thursday and get a new axle, that's probably not going to happen. Right. And that's what I'm talking about. It'd have to be a very unique scenario. If it's just something that isn't working, and it's you jiggled wires, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, um, I mean, we certainly, we will certainly do anything that we can to try to help you and get you out of here so that you can go I mean, our schedule's out. Well, I, I looked earlier today. Our schedule's out until the middle of January right now for service. But I'm overbooking every day for those exact reasons. Um, I, think, I think we've got, um, we've got, I'm overbooked four appointments to mo uh, Monday for that same reason. Those four are actually those emergency scenarios. So We'll see what happens on Monday morning. I, you know, half a dozen customers dropped off already today for, for next week, and we'll probably have some more over there Monday morning that drop off after hours, and we'll have some come in Monday morning. So, but, so on Monday morning, I, I know what Monday looks like now. It's pretty freaking scary right now, but that's what we do. I mean, we do that every day. And, and there's a lot of talent over there. There's a lot of creativity over there. And we'll spread out everything that we got on Monday and say, okay, this is what we got. And if somebody's winterized and they, they're coming in to get a, a cabinet re, you know, rebuild or something, or, and they're already winterized and they have an appointment on Monday and you guys are leaving on Thursday, guess what? I, I'll take care of that. 
the guys, the customer, no offense, but if you're not using it, do you care really? If it's, if it's winterized, do you really care if I wait until tomorrow or Wednesday to do it, if, if I can't get to it on Monday? Probably not, and I hope not, because if the roles are reversed, I'm gonna do the same thing again. If you're in a pinch and the other person doesn't care, I took care of the other person the last time because they were in a pinch and now they don't care. Uh, we do that all day, every day. We did 8,500 work orders last year and it's, we're probably gonna scare 10,000 this year. So we, we do all we can every time we can to try to get you back out. Even if we have to break out the duct tape and bailing twine and just fix something temporarily just so you can go. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> right. Right. Anything else? Thanks for coming today. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.